Hello everyone and welcome to today's stream. Um, today we're going to be working on a Dr. Mundo, which is going to be our main character throughout this special video. Today we're also participating in our Sculptober, where we're going to be... Uh, using the prompt of today's which is Frankenstein so uh, we were thinking about what should we do for the stream and we saw the Frankenstein I remembered Dr. Mundo so let's go for it and I'm gonna be super honest with you guys this is one of the first times that I've seen a concept so clean like this right here like it's not very common that you're gonna get a concept art from an artist that's gonna give you exactly what we need to start sculpting your character which in this case is this right here now i do want to be doing the version like the crazy version right here asterix asterix 3d thanks for the sub man for the community gift thank you very much so we're gonna be we're gonna be sculpting this thing right here oh uh, mustache cactus <laughs> you got the, the sub man congratulations now um the idea is to be able to do as much as possible like as much of the body as possible but i'm gonna be focusing on the top part like a bust and i i actually kind of want to like print it my 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 little brother when we used to play league of legends he used to play mundo so i kind of want to give him a, a little gift right here andy the lich what's up man welcome welcome to the stream so let's start here in, in ZBrush by using a very simple Dynamesh Sphere. And what we're going to do is we're just going to start pulling and pushing the main volumes of our face. There's a lot of methods to do this. Some people like to use base meshes. Some people like to use C-Spheres. I'm, I'm a huge fan of C-Spheres. But in this particular case, I think we can, we can get away with just doing this one right here. I'm looking at the um, uh, inclination that we have right here on the, on the jawline. That's going to be very important. And you can see he's got a little bit of an underbite. Underbite is when the teeth do this, when you push the, the lower jaw forward and then you push up. And, and that's the kind of stuff that we're trying to like capture right here. Delira91, are you who I think you are? I think so. Buenos dias, Mr. Malo. Welcome, welcome. Oh, thanks for the bit, man. Okay, so whenever we're doing a character, I one of the best like advices that I can give, or I usually give my students, is make sure you mark stuff. We we tend to be very, I don't know what the word is, but we tend to be very proud. I'm not sure if it's proud. We just think that we know more than what we actually do, and uh, and we don't mark stuff. So by using guides and and marking stuff, we're gonna be able to make sure that all of our measurements and things are are working on nicely. So the human face it's divided into multiple, or we can divide it into multiple ways. The the first one is of course down the middle, and then I usually like going down the middle of the face as well. And usually, again, usually that's where the eyes are going to be. Now, in, in the case of Mundo, he's got a very, very big jaw. So the proportions are going to be skewed a little bit. And that's when I'm positioning the eyes a little bit higher than what I would normally do. Now, usually when, if, if you've drawn before, you know this, but usually when you draw, you divide the head into thirds, starting at the hairline. So the hairline is going to start right around here. Let's draw a very basic hairline right here. So this will be like the hairline and starting right there we're going to divide from here to the jaw into thirds the first third is usually going to be at the uh, height of the eyebrows right around there the second third is going to be where the nose ends right about there and the third third is of course going to be the the end of the chin now on this last third which is where we have again the nose and the mouth we're also going to divide this into thirds and on the first third of the last third i know this gets a little bit confusing but it's very important on the first them or uh first third of the last third that's where we're going to have the mouth so our mouth is going to be roughly around there now that we have our measurements uh i'm going to start using a method called uh, it's not exactly a crochet but we're going to be doing this sort of like construction method where we're going to start with a very basic shapes and we're going to be building up the whole face by the way if you guys don't know what i usually do is i'm always trying to teach you guys the fundamentals of 3d and art in fun ways so what i'm teaching you right here even though we're doing mundo is we're going over human face anatomy and proportions so uh, this is a tutorial that has been requested on the on the youtube channel uh people want to see me like do um like faces and um i do faces in, in a lot of things in in like the premium courses youtube not 
Well, actually, we've done some in YouTube, but this is like exactly what you guys were asking for. This is just a class on the human proportions. So the the way the face works is, of course, we have the skull and everything is built on top of the skull. So what I'm going to look for right now is I'm going to look for the main like hollow areas that the skull usually has. The eye sockets are, of course, one of those, which is this one right here. Other than that, we have a little like a hollow area. It's kind of like an L shape beneath the zygomatic bone. The zygomatic bone is this cheekbone right here. And you can see Mondos has a very, very strong like um, like zygomatic arc right here. So I'm going to carve in a little bit here. And then I'm going to add a little bit of volume as well. There's another very important part of, uh, of a human face, which is this area right here. Actually, if you guys want to try this out, if you position your hand right here and you, well, actually a little bit like further behind, if you position it right around here and you try to chew, you're going to feel some movement because there's a very like important muscle that helps with mastication. And uh, the, the area where that muscle lives is going to be right here in what's called the temporal bone. So I'm going to carve in a little bit right here. Um, JJ90, welcome to the to the stream, my friend, and thanks for the follow. And yeah, as Sarn is mentioning right there, uh, we do have a special, we have an amazing Discord community. I think one of the the things that, or one of the socials I'm most proud of uh, of the community that we've built so far is our tw our Twitch, our, our Discord. It's just been amazing. So if you guys want to join, we also have ranks for people that are here uh, following and subscribe. So feel free to to follow that link right there. There we go. So I'm just going to start adding a little bit of the ear right here. The ear tends to be tricky, but one of the ways you can remember this and look at the concept right here, the size of the ear is almost always the same size of the uh, nose. So as you can see, Mundo here has a relatively short nose right here. And uh, the base of the nose is pretty much aligned to the base of the ear. And the tip of the nose or where the eyebrows usually are is usually aligned with the base of the or the top of the of the ear as well. So let's just start adding a little bit of effects right there. Then we have the, the jawline, which is amazing in this guy right here. And this is very important. Look at the angle. The, I, I guess if I can teach you guys one secret right now in this first minutes of the stream is you guys need to learn how to see. And, and it sounds very like Mr. Miyagi sort of thing from Karate Kid, but but getting or, or developing that skill where you can actually understand what you're seeing is very important as an artist. So for instance, when I see this right here, one of the things that I'm noticing is I'm noticing the angle at which this jawline is going. And I can notice that my jawline is not going at that angle. So what do I need to do? I need to fix it. I need to make sure that the angle that I'm seeing matches with the angle that I'm sculpting. Okay, so it's very, very important to learn how to see. And I know it sounds very ridiculous when I when I put it like that, but again, it's a very, very important concept. So let's just add that right here. Two more followers till the goal. Yeah, we're really close. Daniel, what's up, man? Welcome. Welcome to the stream, my friend. There we go. So another like little hole that I'm going to add here is going to be, of course, the nose, which is going to be right around this area right here. There we go. Blind artists be like, <laughs> there's a very famous. Uh, uh, let me see if I can find him. There's a he, he went like viral not too long ago here in Mexico. Um, play. This the. There's a very like nice place on the south part of Mexico that's called uh, Oaxaca. And this guy right here, his name is Jose. He is a sculptor and he's blind. Like this freaking guy is blind and he's making this amazing like traditional Mexican sculptures. It's just freaking cool, man. So yeah, he's he's got a disadvantage and he's like beating the shit out of a lot of us. So make sure to practice because there's people out there that even with the hardest disadvantages are going to be making amazing things. So yeah, this guy, I'm, I'm not sure what his last name is, but he, he went viral a couple of weeks ago. Uh, Jose, Jose Garcia Antonio. There you go. That's his full name. Jose Garcia Antonio from Oaxaca. He's a very famous sculptor and he's blind. So no excuses there. No excuses. Um, Sebas Gomez says, hey, one question. What's the best way to smooth without losing details? Trim dynamic. I love using trim dynamic to, no, it's not smoothing per se. What we're doing is we are 
pretty much averaging the normals of the element. So like, look at all of this detail here. If I smooth, as you say, we lose a lot of that detail. It looks very like wobbly. But if we use trim dynamic, what we're doing is we're flattening the normals or the faces that are similar, and we clean the surface without actually destroying a lot of the stuff. I, I talk quite a bit about this in um, in my most recent course, which is the, the stylized character creation, because this, that character is very like League of Legends-like, and, uh, and we cover a lot of that sort of like cleanup process there as well. Uh, yes, we do have a new video about Udems. Uh, it's the canon one. There's a canon, and, uh, and I explained how to do Udems on that one. Okay, so this would be, for me, stage one. And a quick shortcut here instead of Zbrush, Shift S, and you can drop one like little um, element right there. But in this case, what I'm going to do actually is I'm going to save this. Oh. Save S. Let's call this Mundo 00. Mundo 001. And we're going to be like, have, we're, we're going to have multiple saves to, to see the progress as we go in this uh, two hours. So now that we have this, we can go to the secondary shapes, which are like more specific shapes of the character that we need to start uh, finding, uh, such as the nose, a little bit of the lips, and stuff like that. However, in order to do that, we also need to increase the resolution of our mesh. And this is a mistake that I see people make all the time whenever they're working on a character. They will either not increase the resolution like ever and they they try to get all of the details from like a very low subdivision level or they will increase the subdivision very quickly and that's also not ideal because you're going to be struggling with um with a lot of detail that's going to be difficult to clean up later on so i'm going to go here to clay build up i'm going to fill in the nose and before we build the new nose i'm going to increase my resolution to like 224 or something there we go now, from the side view, and this is, again, a, a, an amazing uh, profile that we can use here to, to make sure that we get as close as possible to the concept. Uh, we can see that the, the forehead comes round, and then we have round um, nose, and then, again, the, the underbite uh, jaw that we, that we got there. So I'm going to use my clay buildup here. Let's start adding a little bit more volume. And right now, I'm not worrying about like individual nostrils or anything like that. I just want to worry about or, or try to capture the main, like, again, curvature of the whole thing. So you can see this one right here. This upper lip is pushing up. And again, look at the angle of the lips, right? Like my angle is very low and this angle is a lot flatter. So I'm going to go a lot flatter right there. There we go. Now, of course, over here, we're going to have the lower lips and stuff like that. You can see that the jaw is really, really pushing, but I don't want to add it just yet because I want to teach you guys some very important facts and things about the, the anatomy of a character. So when seen from the front, then we're in a good position here. I'm going to use them in a standard. Just carve in a little bit of the side nostrils right there. There we go. And now we need to add the eyes. So I'm going to go sub tool, append, append the sphere, select the sphere, and we're going to bring the sphere forward. And by doing this, what we're going to be uh, creating is, of course, just a single sphere. Now, if you want cartoon characters, you're usually going to have bigger eyes. If you want realistic characters, they're usually going to be smaller eyes. I actually like to go smaller than you, what you might think is right so that you get to the proper uh, like proportion of the element. Now, I can see here from the side view that the eyes are not like super like into the skull. Like there's not a lot of depth between the eyes and everything else. So I'm going to keep the eyes relatively like uh, like far out. So right around there, probably even a little bit more. And of course, we're going to mirror this to the other side. With the eyes, and this is the, the amazing thing of, of ZBrush and, and Subtools, with the eyes, now we can start sculpting or adding volume for things such as the um, the eye backs, right? The eyelids. And the cool thing is that, as we know, the eyes are going to act as a mask. What about Spotlight? I don't use a Spotlight, to be honest. I, I, I was trained a little bit more traditionally in that regard. So when I learned sculpting, I, I did traditional sculpting. I did quite a bit of uh, time uh, with traditional sculpting. And you don't have spotlight in real life. So it was a lot of look at the reference, mimic it. Look at the reference, mimic it. And, um, and that's how I learned. So that's why I don't use a spotlight. But if you want to, it, it's perfectly fine. There we go. Now we're not going to give it like super angry eyes because Mundus a little bit. I, I've always found him like very, like, sort of like like cool but dumb i don't know 
Okay, now um, we're going to start talking about some important folds that we have in our character. And you can see one of them right here going from the corner of the eye all the way down to the mouth. That's part of the nasolabial fold. So the nasolabial fold, as the name implies, goes from the nose all the way to the mouth like this. Now on this, like here's where sometimes references are not going to match perfectly because we're not really seeing this like super harsh nasolabial fold on the um, on the front view but we are seeing it on the side view yes yes proportions are, are again they're like uh, sorry spotlight is an amazing way to to make sure that you get all of the proportions like perfectly right However, one thing that at least I was taught when, when I was a student is that there's always going to be some variations between 2D and 3D, and it's fine if, if there are. So your job as a, as, as a 3D artist is, of course, to capture the concept, to capture the, the essence of the concept, but also to, to do a little bit of interpretation and make sure you, you make the right decisions to make it look the best you can. So, so that's the kind of stuff like that, that, I, that I follow. Let's go right there. I'm gonna modify the silhouette of the of the nose a little bit there to exaggerate. And then I'm gonna use my trim dynamic here to clean that up a little bit. There's another very like nice line that I like adding right here beneath the, the eyelids. There we go. Now right here on the lips underneath the bigger lip underneath the, the lower lip we are going to be uh, like removing a little bit of volume here to make sure that we get uh, the nice dip that we're seeing right here and then we're going to have the big chin Sebas says excuse me but what do you mean with spotlight a spotlight is a thing that we have here inside of uh, zbrush i i actually like it's been so long since i used it that i don't even remember where it is texture where was it it's a it's a thing it's a little tool that's inside of zbrush where you, here we go and edit spotlight so it's a little tool that you can use to um to load images and project them inside of zbrush and some people use them as image planes so yeah Cinefonts says, I know you're in Seabrush, but I got a question for Maya. If we want to do image projection modeling and project the image for textures to have a quick environment, do you have any tutorial? I don't. I have a, a camera matching tutorial that we did for Blender uh, not too long ago, but that's a good idea. I'll, I'll, I'll see what I can do about that in the next couple of days. Okay, so now I'm going to add a little bit more volume here on the on the nasolabial fold, which is this fold that goes, again, from the nose all the way to the lips. And we can start uh, adding a little bit of volume here to the lips. Usually, when you see the mouth from underneath, you should see this sort of like U shape. That's another very common mistake that people make when, when doing faces. They will not have enough curvature on the mouth, and the mouth should curve because the teeth curve, right? So, so it's very important that we, we try to capture that. Another important muscle that you guys are going to find on the face is this one right here, this one, and it's called the uh, maxillaris, I believe, which is one of the ones that we use for mastication. So I'm going to add the volume right there. Kind of blends itself with the jawline. Of course, Mundo has a very, very strong jawline. Mundo reminds me a little bit of uh, Thanos as, as well. I get the, I guess there's a little bit of uh, <laughs> similarity not not just because of the of the purple skin there's also some um, other stuff okay now here what I want to do is I'm gonna like move the shape of the eyes a little bit because I really want to like maintain the sort of like round the uh, eyes that the Munda has kind of like spotlights so I'm gonna be very careful on how I I create this. I think we need to add a little bit more eyebrows. I know he has this very like bushy eyebrows, which we're going to have to sculpt, right? If we want to 3D print this little bust right here, we're going to have to sculpt all of the hair. So let's add this right here. He's a zombie with steroids. Yeah, pretty much. There we go. Let's keep cleaning. And again, here, if I need to clean a little bit, I'm just going to use Trim Dynamic. That's going to re it's going to keep the form and clean it up a little bit without having to smooth. Because if we smooth, we lose form and we lose detail, which is not what we want right now. 
Okay, I, I do think we need to open the mouth a little bit. So here's my very quick trick to do that. I'm going to go to mask lasso. We're going to mask the lower mouth right here and the jaw. And usually, if I know that the character is going to have its mouth open and he's going to talk, I like to do this as soon as possible. Because otherwise, it becomes a little bit, like, not complicated, but it's just... It's just more difficult than or, or later to, to transfer all of the details. So let's Dynamesh. You can see that we get a little bit of a mess here in the neck. But since we're still in Dynamesh, we can very easily just like stitch this together and, and fix it. And then there's a couple of different ways to do it. But in this case, since we have uh, or we're in a good position, I can just grab this right here. Sick boy, thanks for the follow, my friend. Just one more for our goal today. There we go. So I'm just going to invert this and I'm going to push it. Push it. And then I'm going to control W. That's going to create a polygroup of that like inner side. That's Dynamesh. And if we select this guy right here, we can do an inflate. An inverse inflate in this case. To open the mouth. Let's see if that works. Seems to have worked. We might need to do a little bit of cleanup here. Oh, there you go. We got to our follower goal. Thanks, uh, Cinephones. No, who was the who was the one that got us the was it Cinephones? Yeah, it was Cinephones. There you go. Thanks, man. Uh, hi, thanks, says I need some advices. I want to be a 3D journalist, but I'm I suck at drawing. Should I need to learn traditional hand drawing or large software such as Houdini, Speedtree, Nuke? Uh, thank you for making great content. Uh, well, yeah, first of all, welcome, my friend, to, to the to the stream. Okay, this is really messed up. We got a lot of things that we don't want right there. Oh, thanks for the bits, man. Thank you for the bits. So, if you want to be a generalist, you you don't, like, you're, you're selecting very specific, um, very specific softwares. So, Houdini is very specific for, like, explosion, simulation, and things like that. Or at least that's what it's uh, mainly known for. I'm not saying that that's the only thing that it can do, but it's, like, the main, uh, one of the main strengths. Um, and then Speed 3 is for trees, and Nuke is for compositing. So, you're not even, like, you're not re naming any any traditional like uh, 3d software um that you would need as a generalist I, I, not ideally usually the softwares that people pick are things such as maya 3d studio max and blender right so if you want to be a generalist if you want to be modeling and texturing rigging animating you need something called a dcc application which you probably already know and i would recommend if you're going into the into the studio environment if you want to work for big studios and big productions then maya is probably a good bet if you want to do more indie stuff um or you want to work on smaller studios then um blender is really good it's the eternal debate of which one is better maya blender uh, they're they're both like really good at what they do so uh, you, you're gonna it's not the tool i've mentioned this before it's not just the tool there's other factors as well that you need to take into account but i would pick one of those uh seabrush of course if again if you want to be um a, a prop artist environment artist or something you need to know seabrush seabrush nowadays is pretty much like a must the the only thing that seabrush doesn't have unfortunately is like animation like proper animation and rigging things if it did people wouldn't leave seabrush like they would be inside of seabrush pretty much all day um because you could do everything in here but it's it's the like the sculpting software uh, by excellence you have any human realistic anatomy tutorial like concentrating anatomy not yet but i am planning on doing something it's probably gonna be for early next year but um but yes there's there's one like uh one um course like premium course that i've been planning and i have it on my mind um i've been i've been delving on it for quite a while but we we haven't find the time to to work on it so so probably early next year we're gonna have a a full anatomy course like an anatomy for artist course something like that okay so we're gonna use the cylinder just as a basic uh some basic teeth but again as you guys uh, know we have a little bit of an underbite so i'm gonna have this cylinder right here and i'm gonna duplicate it i'm gonna have the other cylinder right here so as you can see, that's a very, very easy way to, to generate a little bit of an underbite without having to sculpt all of the teeth just yet. We're probably going to do it, but not just yet. Now, I'm going to change my clay buildup from this uh, square one to a round alpha. And this is going to allow me to 
um, to have softer, softer details around the character. And you can see again, look at the shapes, like learn to see this shapes, learn to see how the artist is conveying this specific shape right there. And that's the specific shape or the specific pattern that we want to, to copy for ourselves. Same thing here, like see this shadow? That shadow tells me that there's a volume right here because this volume is projecting a shadow on this side right here. You can also move the light, by the way, if you're using this material right here, you can move the light. And if you do so, you might be able to find your, your forms a little bit better. That's another great advice that I give in my in my ZBrush course is always try to, to move your light to see how like things are looking because it's going to give you a, a way more uh, precise um, idea of your of the proper proportions. Now I can see that, the, look at this, the lower lip from Mundo right here is very sharp. So I'm going to grab my trim dynamic and we're going to flatten this out to create a, a way sharper effect. Uh, thanks for the follow, Worry Nice. Welcome, welcome to the stream. How does 3D code sculpting compare to ZBrush? I haven't tried it, Ivja, so um, I wouldn't be able to, to give you a, an educated opinion. Uh, and thanks for the follow, by the way. But it's really good. Like, it's good. From what I've seen, from the things that I've seen people make with it, it's it's a good option. It might not come, or in, I don't think it's up to the level of ZBrush just yet, but that doesn't mean that's not going to be there or it can't be there. And uh, another thing that you guys need to understand about the, the industry in general is that not every project is going to require you to do like freaking amazing things like uh, like Iron Man and the Hulk and things like that. There's a lot of projects <laughs> where what you're going to be doing are barrels, benches, houses, I don't know, garbage cans, uh, lampposts, concrete barriers, and all of those things you can do inside the Blender, you can do inside the Maya, you can do inside the 3D code. So usually this, like, especially softwares like uh, ZBrush, you're going to be using most of the advanced tools for the very advanced things. But there's a lot of things in the project that are not as advanced, and um, and you can use any project to to do those. Chila Kid, what's up, my friend? Welcome to the to the um, to the stream. Very early today. In Mexico, we say madrugando. Which is waking up early. Sick Boy says, I'm a beginner character artist looking for a job. Is it necessary to be perfect in human anatomy or I can apply for the job by having basic understanding? Uh, for, for character artists, yes, you need to have perfect anatomy. Like, it's very, it's very obvious when a character has wrong anatomy. So... So yeah, I would recommend your anatomy to be, to, your anatomy to be at a really good level. It doesn't have to be perfect. Like you don't have to be uh, like Raphael Grissetti level of uh, anatomy perfection uh, when you're a junior artist. Because again, you're not gonna be most probable. You're most probably you're not gonna be doing the hero character of the of the game or of the film or of the commercial. You're gonna be doing like secondary characters and things like that. So so you don't have to have like super perfect anatomy, but you need to have like a decent one. Like it needs to look realistic. All the muscles should be where they're supposed to be. Like all that kind of stuff has to be like pretty much nailed down. Yeah, the, it's just my style. It's a very common, um, very common excuse that a lot of people use to to justify when their anatomy is not on point. Did you intentionally add more clay to the muscle volume? Yes, I'm, I'm going a little bit more than I should right now. And we're going to be softening it up a little bit with trim dynamic once we go into like the stylization phase. So it's kind of like building, building up and then polishing. That's kind of like the, the, um, the process that I'm following right now. I missed one question. Um, Aki is a bye. Welcome, man, to the chat. Uh, Marley Peters asks, I really want to do figure sculpting for statues like anime and stuff, and I've noticed it's not talked about as much as opposed to the other industry, ZBrush community. Yeah, no, I, I, I've used ZBrush for a lot of stuff. Um, I've done, like, jewelry, quite a bit of jewelry. I've done uh, renders, 3D printing. Um, there was... I was very proud about this one. So you guys know Burning Man? Burning Man... So, like, a couple of years ago, I was asked to design this statue for Burning Man, and it won. Burning Man does this sort of thing where they they ask people to to send up send their ideas, and then the ideas that get approved, they get, like, a, 
like a grant so that they can develop them. So I did the design for this character. I didn't build it in, in the real uh, world. Um, there were some very skilled artisans and, and sculptors that did the real like thing, but I did the, the design and I use ZBrush for this one. And uh, right now it's touring Mexico, like they use it for like presentations and stuff. So yeah, this, uh, this like, uh, and Alebrije is like this mystical creature. Of course I took some inspiration. So I took some inspiration from the, um, from the panther from Coco. You know, and then I took some inspiration from things that I liked, and uh, it was just like a very fun uh, process. And uh, and I did the design and the 3D model in ZBrush, and then I believe they used some CNC or something to print it, and paint it, and prepare it, and everything. It was quite successful. Like people really liked it. Yeah, the, the feedback is always tricky because feedback is. When you're an artist and you spend a lot of time working on your on your stuff, on your sculpture, on your craft or whatever, and you get feedback, it sometimes can feel like a personal attack on you because it's it's um, really difficult to separate yourself from your art. And you feel like if someone says that your art sucks, what they're saying is that you suck. When in reality, of course, that's not the case. It's, it's the art. Like, you need to be able to separate the art from the artist. And... Um, and a lot of people can't do that, so that's why a lot of people can't handle criticism. Now, another thing that I tell people, especially my students when they are uh, young and they're getting quite upset about uh, like harsh critiques or feedback that they get is, you guys need to understand that you cannot... Like, if you want to really judge an art piece, you need to know the full context, right? So, for instance, at the end of this stream, if I present this uh, sculpt to someone, they are going to be critiquing a lot of things. But then if I tell you, oh, yeah, but I did it in two hours, it's like, oh, okay, that changes things. If you told me that you spent 40 hours on this, then, well, you need to work, right? Like, you need to improve. But if you tell me, oh, it was like a quick sculpt, two hours, oh, that's a that's a whole different story. So there's a lot of context that we don't see about the, the pieces, the art pieces online. Like, I remember when I was uh, when I was just learning Seabrush, and I would go to Seabrush Central and see the top row, and people would be like, oh, this is my first time using the software, and there was this, like, freaking amazing skulls like no dude it's either it's not the first time using the software or it's not the first time you touch a 3d software like you maybe you were like an artist for 10 years using my and other things and now you just recently jump into seabrush and you created this amazing piece but we don't know the full context right so unless you know how much time they spend how much money was invested on the piece in case there was like an investment like it's very difficult to judge so that's why I, I I tend to very easily separate uh, the art from the from the artist. Uh, let's see, uh, Evil Fry. Oh wait, first uh, we got Warren says it's easier when my own critiques are way harsher than anyone else. <laughs> yeah, that that definitely helps. And, and you should be like you should be your 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 first uh, uh, like quality control. Like if you don't like it, it's difficult that people are gonna like it. I see people do see remesh from the sphere, then do basic forms, then just sub the when they decide to edit this. Is it okay just to use Dynamesh from the start and increase? Yeah, yeah, it's perfectly fine, Evil Fry. The the only thing I don't like about Dynamesh, especially when you get to the to the higher points, is that it becomes a little bit difficult to control certain details, as you mentioned. So certain types of wrinkles and things like that, it, it can become a little bit uh, tricky. For instance, here in the lips, you can see that due to the way that the Dynamesh is um is organized, I'm not gonna be able to sculpt as much detail as I might like right now. But if we increase the resolution, we might be able to to get away with it. There's no really, there's not really a rule that says, oh, you must change to subdivision at this particular point or whatever. Like that, that, that doesn't exist. Okay, I think we definitely need to add a uh, hair, a little bit of hair, just to just to get an idea of how things are looking. So I'm gonna add this sphere. Let's turn on symmetry. Let's turn on Dynamesh. It's just a basic blocking for the hair. Now I'm gonna break symmetry. And I'm just gonna like throw in some like quick strokes right here too. Again, just to give me an idea of, of roughly how this hair is gonna be like organized. It looks very dumb right now, but that's fine. Hair is one of those things that definitely takes time. Like, if you try to rush it, you're gonna get some weird results. Uh, 
So let's see how we how we, how we do it on time with this guy. Because here is is definitely challenging. The barber. <laughs> How do you stop the dynamic from destroying details? Yes, increase the resolution is usually the, the way to go. Okay, I'm also gonna append the thanks for the follow, Apple Fry. Thanks for the follow, man. Let's move the eyes a little bit again. I want to have them like really round eyes. You can see he has he's kind of like angry surprise, but he's not surprised with the eyes, he's surprised with the eyebrows because he's more like a corpse, right? So so we gotta be very careful of how we how we portray that. And, and he's always sort of like a noble giant, right? Aki Senpai, thanks for the follow, man. Can we get to 410? That'll be interesting. I mean 400 uh, followers is quite a bit as well. I remember when I started I started streaming uh, during the pandemic and then I stopped and we, we just picked it back up a couple of months ago. Which is hard, man. In general, content creation is quite challenging, if I may say so. <laughs> but it's been a very enjoyable experience. And it's all thanks to you guys. There we go. That looks a little bit closer. Let's add the eyebrows. We'll get there, we'll get there. See, one thing I, I've always considered myself is I'm, I'm very patient, so... I know that uh, if I keep doing this and we keep uh, providing useful content and, and a great community, we'll get there. There's no rush. There's no rush. There we go. Let's mirror again. There we go. And just to just do a little bit of texture. We'll come back to the hair later. I just want to add a little bit of like silhouette and texture to start seeing things a little bit closer to what they are. Cool. So now, now that we have this, uh, I would call this the second stage, right? So you guys remember the first stage? Let's uh, save this. That's Mundo002. <laughs> Sorry. So, this was the first stage, just super basic forms, the proportions, and all that sort of stuff. The second stage, which is secondary forms, which is the main position of a lot of the things. Now, we can start being a little bit more um, precise, and we can try to match all of the little like positions of the different things so for instance i take a look at the eyes and i realize that the eyes and like the distance from the eyes and the nose is really short like he's got everything in this sort of like frame and my eyes right now are a little bit too high so i'm gonna bring the eyes down position them where i would expect them to be which is right around there and of course i need to go to the to the face and just move the whole face so that we match again the distance a little bit more. I also see that the shape of the nose is a little bit different. And here's where where the time starts like um, like piling up because we we really need to start adding and modifying all of this like small details. And it takes a while to make sure that we match the the exact concept that we're going for. Let's add a little bit of the eyelids. He does have eyelids. It's just that they're very round and very small. I'm gonna have a little bit of an eyelid right there. Oh. There we go. Actually, let me hide the eyes just a second, because you can see it's it's getting a little bit difficult to sculpt like on this area, so I'm just gonna bring my geometry forward a little bit dynamesh so that the geometry is a little bit closer to the surface and now i should be able to add the upper eyelid a little bit easier there we go let's 
let's just trim dynamic and start cleaning off stuff so again it's very really weird because if you see this thing right here the nasal labial fault on the front view is not that visible but on the side view it's quite visible so so we need to decide what we're gonna do there i think the eyes are way too forward so let's, let's push them in i'm gonna be using this as my main sort of effect okay I, one thing i see here is that the nasal labial for is starting really really high really close to the to the eye i think that's definitely gonna help uh some people use reference as background like they put the image behind the image with low opacity and skull for better shape yeah 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 that's that's great that's a that's a great way and, and i probably gonna do that in just a second just to make sure that we match it perfectly but again, I, I, I was trained a little bit more traditional in that sense. So I like to develop my or, or practice my analysis process by doing it a little bit more manually, if that makes sense. Remember that there's a ton of different methods to do things, like literally a ton of different methods. And um, there's I wouldn't say that there's one method that's better than another. The best method is the one that works the best for you. So the one that you can use to be fast, to be efficient, and to match things, that's the method you should use. So I've had uh, thousands of students along the years, and, um, and that's always like a very, very common question. It's like, oh, which, which method should I use? It's like, it really doesn't matter as long as you can do it. Like if you prefer doing C modeler instead of modeling in Maya, or if you prefer using Blender for sculpting, as long as you can get me the result, if you're working on a, on a project with me, that's all I care about. Is there a place in your server where you are willing to critique sculpts? I have sculpt I've been focused on, but I think it would be better for me to move on and apply. Yeah, of course. We have the Whips channel, and we also have portfolio review every month. Uh, our next portfolio review is actually next week. So if you have multiple pieces or even a single piece and you want me to review it, we're going to be reviewing it live here on the, on the stream next uh, Friday. So next Friday, we got uh, our portfolio review. I keep tips, tricks, and, and, and advice on, on portfolios from people. You can submit in the, in the channel as well. And yeah, the server is like a really, really cool place. We got people from all over the world. We got very talented artists. I'm there as well, of course, answering questions whenever I can. Right now we have the event, the Sculptober event. We actually have another event. Oh, actually, no, Portfolio Review is not next week. It's in the week after, because next week we got the um, uh, the the contest. We have a contest going right now, which is the Weapons of Legend contest. And uh, we're going to be doing a... Um, we're going to be doing the live review of all the participants. You guys still have one week to participate on that one, by the way. The price is $100. And, uh, and you can participate on the on the server on the server as well it says should a piece made from tutorials be in the portfolio no it, it should not usually no and the reason why that is is because everyone else can do the piece as well so you're not really like the only thing that you're showing or the only thing that you're demonstrating is that you know how to follow instructions which is good it's a skill of course like not everyone that starts a tutorial finishes it but um if you really want to if you really want to put yourself uh, out there and, and have an advantage what you need to do is take the tutorial information and then use that information to create your own piece i did a video like a month ago or something i actually consider that to be one of my most valuable videos but uh you know how the how the audience is in, in youtube so not everyone is interested in learning the, the hard truth sometimes it's called how to learn and uh, in that one, I explain the type of projects that you should pick depending on what kind of stuff that you... Or I think it's called how to pick a project, uh, the video. If we have a link over here, I'll, I'll, I'll share it in just a second. But um, in that video, I explain what you're asking about the portfolio pieces. And one of those things is a tutorial should be used to learn, not to develop something for your portfolio. You can use what you learn from a tutorial to create a new piece, and that new piece can definitely be in your portfolio but um but usually a portfolio project's not the best idea for your portfolio okay now let's soften this you can see that there's not a lot of uh, detail right there so i'm going to use again my clay build up 
to just clean all of this stuff up. And keep the questions coming. One of the things that I, I like about the stuff that I make is that I, I try to be as transparent as possible. So I don't think there's ever been a question that I haven't been able to, to give an answer to. And if I don't know the answer, I'll just tell you right away. And I might be able to give you a... a, a um, what's the word? An idea on where to look. There's the video. Thank you, David. Uh, one thing I will do after I'm done with my projects is that I'm going to take a pause from making original artworks and will probably start doing art from other people. It's a very energy consuming to do your own stuff, yes, versus going after already existing artworks, especially as a perfectionist. Yes, yes, that's um, that's right. And and I try to do the same thing. Like uh, I, I try to, to use concepts whenever I need to just not think about stuff and just like do the, the art, like in this case, right? Like I don't need to invent my own frankenstein i'm just using mundo um but it is important that you especially if you if you don't want to just be a, a like a uh, a technical guy that knows how to do stuff but doesn't know how to create stuff it is important that you exercise your creative muscle and come up with your own stuff as well what's the best way to take pictures of your sculpts that retain good quality um you mean renders or or sculpts in real life Renders or real life? What do you mean? Ah, for a work in progress, um, I, I would always do renders, to be honest. And we do have a um, there's another video in the YouTube channel. I'm telling you guys, I got I got you covered. I got videos for all the things that you might be looking for. There's one called How to Make a Clay Render. I'm not sure if I did that on Blender. I think I did it on Blender, uh, so that anyone can follow because it's it's free. And even if it's a work in progress, I'll just do a clay render. You can just save a scene for a clay render and use that or reuse that one every time you need it. Because, yeah, if you just take a screenshot like from here, it, it doesn't look that great. So you always want to be giving or, or, or showing the best possible thing from your sculpt. And even if that requires like 30 extra minutes, maybe one extra hour of, um, of going into another software and doing it, I think it's worth it. David has a great question there. It says, do you think creativity can be trained? And if yes, how much? See, that's a debate that I've have seen and, and had with several people online and in person. It's like, can can it create like is, is, is he a creative person born or or is he like created, right? And and I think it has to do with um or I think it's how to put it this way. I'm gonna use uh like uh, Olympic athletes as an as an example. Uh, like Usain Bolt and Michael Phelps and, and these guys. Like, if, like, can anyone be a professional, like, swimmer, right? Or a professional runner? Can you learn how to run fast? And the answer is yes. If you learn the technique, if you learn things, if you learn, like, uh, proper, I don't know, like, breathing, I don't know. If you learn the techniques and you learn the, the, the stuff that you need to know, you can learn how to run fast. However, can you run at the level of a freaking Olympian not always like there are other factors genetics uh, uh environment i don't know like there's other things involved in in that sort of stuff and if i think creativity is is similar like yes you can train creativity and you can be a very creative person and come up with really interesting ideas but there's some people out there that are just freaking insane right in what they do as in um as in, um, as in the, the ideas and the creativity that they have. So, so it's not that you can't do it. It's just that there will be people that due to certain, again, conditions, uh, upbringing, uh, socials, other things will be more creative. But there, like, I truly believe that with enough uh, effort, you can be in a in a bracket, let's say, where your creativity is far above what uh, the average person has, and that's gonna get you like in in very good positions in very cool projects. 
yeah, yeah, it's it, it's exactly where, where the, I, I guess that's the, the idea. Uh, like, I, I've been playing chess for a little while, for like two years or something, and um, and I see that there, like, all of the pros say the same things. Like, anyone can, like, learn chess and become really good at it. Like, you could, like, anyone who puts their time in could get to, like, 1800 or something ELO. And if you're 1800, like, you're already, like, the, I think, like, 1% of the world, right? So, but to get to the 0.01% where, like, the grandmasters are, that's a whole lot of, like more dedication that you're gonna need. You need to start really early. Like it's a, it's a, it, it's not easy. But you again, unless that's your goal, you don't need that to be really good at something. So, so I truly, truly believe that you can be very good at something, very proficient, get paid for it, and that doesn't necessarily mean that you need to be the best. I, I guess there's um that that's more of my philosophical like stance nowadays. I feel like people are way too competitive and way too focused on being the best and the best and the best like there's so many more things in life you could just be good and that's it like why always try to be the best i don't know some people are very competitive in that sense i'm not so but that's just literally like really my, my personal opinion okay i'm not saying you shouldn't be good i'm not saying you shouldn't train and you shouldn't improve our motto is always learning always improving after all it's just that uh, there's certain levels of, uh, what's the word, demand? Is that the, could that be the word? Like, the, the either self, uh, like the your own self, like judge, where you think like you need to be really, 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 really freaking good to, to like industry standards where they're just like ridiculous. Some exercises to work that is mixing different references into a single piece in the world. Yeah, that's that's a really good one. Just trying to do a collage. We did that a couple of weeks ago when Starfield released. We tried doing a, a an alien, a creature, and we ended up with like a bear that had some sort of like fungi, uh, like a symbiotic relationship or something. It was cool. But yeah, like I, I'm going to give you guys an example because this is again a... a a topic about uh, about the thing that we're talking about, right? Like the the levels and stuff. Like I'm a huge fan of Monster Hunter, and uh, Monster Hunter Rise came up a couple of uh, years ago. And you take a look at the models, right? And look at that model. Like if you present this, and that's the funny thing, if you present this model as your portfolio, like if a character artist would present this in front of like pro artists, every pro artist would be like, oh, your model sucks, it's very low poly, the textures are not here, are not there. This is a triple E game, this already shipped, right? So this works. You don't need to have like super amazing characters all the time. Sometimes the project will require a level of quality that is not exactly the level of quality that you can deliver, but due to time constraints, due to money constraints, due to a lot of different things, you might not have the chance to really like push things to the very very like like um uh end of the of the quality line Cinephone says dude your mindset is actually impressive good for you thank you man thank you i'm very physically strong but i know that i won't be the be, exactly I, i'm very physically strong says andy the lich but i know that i won't be the world's strongest man and it's okay don't stop me from going to the gym and become the best possible version of exactly that's exactly what I, i'm saying man like you can be really good so talking about creativity you can be really creative are you going to be the most creative guy in the world maybe maybe not like it depends on a lot of factors one of them is of course yourself and putting in the work to make sure that um that you get as close as possible to your goal but if if that's not your goal then just being good and enjoying the ride i think it's it's more than important i'm gonna give you guys another example here let me show you let's go full screen so back here this all of this are my uh dungeons and dragon books all of them and uh, I'm a huge fan of Dungeons and Dragons, as you guys know. And if you guys are into the into the um, what's the word? If you guys are into the Dungeons and Dragons uh, community, you guys know that there's this very um, famous group called Critical Role. And these guys are freaking voice actors, and they have an amazing story and everything. They're really really cool. 
And unfortunately, something that has happened to the D&D community, I've been playing D&D for more than 15 years. So I've been playing all, way before um, Critical Role. And uh, one thing that has happened ever since Critical Role started is that people who are new to the hobby or getting to the hobby, they're expecting you to be as good as Matt Mercer, right? They call this the Mercer effect. Or they expect you to be able to be as creative, uh, creative as Talos and Jeffy or as uh, as funny as, um, as uh, Liam. Or like, there, there's a lot of expectations because they see these famous guys and they're like, oh, that's the way to play. That's the way to, to enjoy the game. And it's one way to enjoy the game. It's one way to play, but it's not the exact same thing. Or it doesn't mean that it's the only way, rather. Like, there's a bunch of different ways to enjoy it. And as long as you are enjoying it and you have fun with your friends, that's all that matters. That's all that matters. Backboy says, uh, that's something that triggers me the most. Some customers don't realize that just because my portfolio stuff doesn't look like what they're looking for, I'm not able to achieve the product that they're looking for, and I don't know how to prove it. Oh, okay, well, that's a slightly different story, and, and I know what you mean. I, I definitely know what you mean. So, yeah, that's... Um, Oh, that's a very, very big question because I, I've lived that. I, I've gone through that uh, exactly the same thing, back, boy. So I know what you mean when you say, how can I... How can I convey to them that I can do what they're looking for, even though my portfolio doesn't have anything that they have? Ideally, you should have something that's close to what they're looking for, because it's very difficult to convince someone without like actually seeing something, right? So if you can build a couple of pieces, like if you've seen that people are looking for stylized stuff and you don't have stylized stuff in your portfolio, even though you can do or you've done stylized stuff before, my advice would be do a couple of those to make sure that um to make sure that you can um that you can do whatever they're asking for because yeah otherwise it's gonna be very very hard then the other one is try to and i see i saw this recently on uh like an entrepreneur thing i'm getting a lot of those things in my tiktok and stuff like that try to split the cost say hey you want me to do a character i'm charging you this much let's do this i'm gonna charge you less but I'm going to be, um, what's the word? But I'm going to be expecting some share of the revenue. I don't know, 10%, 15%, 20%. Or I'll do it for free, but I want 40% of the revenue of how much like this product sells with my stuff. So usually if you, but that has to do more with like negotiation and business skills that aren't itself. Um, but it's a, it's a good way to also try to, to, to find common grounds with your client. Because um, I was reading about this and they say that when someone does not buy your product, it's not necessarily because they don't trust you. It's because they don't trust themselves. So they don't want to be wrong and or they don't want to make a mistake. So your job as a, as a salesman in this case is to give them as many solutions and as much peace so that they know that the decision that they're making is going to be the right one. So, yeah. Okay, yeah, that, that in that case, my friend, yeah, just try to have one version with high poly. Like, it doesn't have to be the exact one, but you can be like, hey, yeah, you like this soldier? Well, look at this knight that I have that's high poly. I can do the exact same thing. I just don't have a soldier right now that is high poly. And it's all about, uh, again, it's all about um, making sure or trying to make it so that your client feels as safe and as as reassured about their decision of working with you as possible if you can do that you're on the other side you can give them the the confidence that they're making a good decision by going with you that's what we're looking for okay so we're getting there i definitely feel like some elements are a little bit too exaggerated so so let's clean that up and you know what? Like, I'm not sure why I haven't done this before. Let's just go purple. <laughs> it's going to be, this is going to allow us to, to analyze the shapes a little bit better even. Let's go to the hair real quick. I'm going to do a color and fill object. Fill object. I feel the wrong object. There we go. Color, feel object. This guy's going to be... Well, that's a little bit too saturated. I 
actually, it's just gets rid of polypate then. There we go. Real object there. Unfortunately, we can't pick the color from the, that. This is where spotlight could be a little bit more useful. Because we could just like grab grab it from the image. There we go. Zombie Hulk. That kind of looks like Zombie Hulk, right? Let's turn that off for just a second, actually. I feel like that's a little bit too dark on the on the elements. Okay. Now, as you can see, we are in a good position, but we need to add a little bit more resolution. So I'm gonna increase my resolution and let's start with the polishing itself. So for the polishing, I really like using Train Dynamic, and the most important part of this uh, uh, part of the process is to start defining the edges of the elements. So for instance, the nose usually has a very like sharp edge as we get to the to the border of the nose. Same for the nostrils. So we should see a little bit of a division from one point to another. What happens when we make a right click on the? It goes to the back. I think it goes to the back. But other than that, it doesn't happen. Or do you mean like in Blender? In Blender, you could just... Uh, oh, careful here. We got a little bit of an issue. You can see that the cheekbone there... Look at that. That's bad. So, how do we fix those holes? Inflate. Just inflate those holes. Inflate on the inside. Inflate right there on the mouth. And then Dynamish. Gotta be very careful about those. Because uh, for 3D printing, those like suck and that's one of the unfortunate things about doing the open mouth eventually i would just like boolean everything back together so that it's uh, a single mesh but right now we're gonna keep it which render engine do you feel the most powerful for filmmaking arnold v-ray cycle blender unreal engine Actually, none of the above. Uh, Renderman. Renderman is the one that they use at Disney for Star Wars, for Pixar, for a lot of things. It's a really, really powerful. Like, impressively powerful. But it's very technical. I used it for a while. I think I used it from like 2016 to 2019, roughly. We were using Blender here at the studio, or my old studio. And um, it, was, it was a good one. It's a really powerful software. But it's also pricey, so... That's why not a lot of people use it. Arnold is really good as well. Like you can do amazing things with Arnold. But see, one of the and, and this is something that I taught on, on, on an old class that I had, which is a cinematic class. The cinematic look that people usually think or or or, or like is usually color grading. It's all about color grading. So most of the things you can do in, in, in all of the engines, or in, in most of the engines. And color grading, Nuke or DaVinci or whatever you're using, that's where, where most of the magic happens and, and that's where you really get the sort of like cinematic look. Because for instance, I really like Arnold. I feel like Arnold is a, it's a really good software as well. Cycles is not bad either. Actually for animation, the denoiser that, that Cycle has, I feel like it's better than Arnold's. Because Arnold, I still get a little bit of a grady effect. And for cycles, um, it kind of like smooths out through the frames, so I really like it. Walkabout says, hello, can you do a YouTube video about asset game ready? I know you have a cursory blender, but I mean the essential details of low poly, number of polygons. Oh, okay, like uh, like information of, of what makes a low poly or a game asset a game asset. Yeah, I can do that, actually. I think that could be quite informative. But these eyes are having a little bit of a problem, having a, a little bit of an issue trying to, to give the very like round effect.
And yeah, welcome to the stream, my friend. What does he have on the ear? It's like a tag or something, right? I'm gonna push the teeth a little bit further forward. Just so that we can see it better. And let's go back to our trim dynamic. And for instance, all of this like uh, like noisy sort of like pattern that we're seeing here. This is where the trim dynamic works really nicely because you can use it to kind of like blend all of this while retaining your form. So we're not losing the form and we're going to be getting cleaner and nicer shapes. Also, trim dynamic is really good to, to get this sort of like hard edge and kind of like stylized effect. So if you want to have a little bit more of a cartoony look to the whole thing. This is very very useful for instance here you can see how the the lower lip is very straight so trim dynamic is really good too to give us that sort of detail there we go And I'm trying to recapture the circularity of the eye, which is quite hard because usually eyes are like almond shape. But this guy has like little light bulbs. Let's go to the ears. We haven't worked on the ears for a way for a while. Uh, do you believe in AI? In future, AI could make characters and we will just tweak them? Yeah, it's probably going to be what's going to happen. Not every type of character, but there's going to be a lot of like base meshes and things that we're going to be able to get uh, thanks to AI. Is there a systematic way to learn sculpting techniques like what you did in art school? Uh, like traditional or traditional sculpting or or um, or ZBrush? Because for ZBrush, uh, on, my, on my premium courses, I always try to follow a like an educational approach where we... The hell happened here i try to follow an educational approach where we go step by step exercise by exercise and we learn about all the things that you need to learn to to um understand the software as for traditional sculpt i'm like i, I took some classes but i'm not really a traditional sculpture we did like a like a character and we did like a bust then we did like a real size real size head so practice practice is a it's a good way it's usually the the only way in art to to get better just practice human form like learning about a human form it's a good way to do it i know some people do like studies like they'll they'll do like a cylinder and then they'll do like um like cones and things like that when drawing this is what drawing, but you could apply something similar to to sculpting. Oh, it's a funny, funny profile. I'm getting all I messed up with my cold. Bridge of the nose goes a little bit higher. The lip, as you can see, goes a little bit higher as well. So I'm going to use Trim Dynamic here to start profiling the lip a little bit better. So you can see again the distance. That curvature right there, I don't have it. So I need to capture it. That's the kind of stuff that art directors are always looking for. If you manage to capture the the important silhouette and the important points of your sculpt.
what have you guys been playing this week i finally finally got a little bit of time to get into Baldur's gate again i'm playing with with a controller now it's uh it's quite nice playing it on my phone there we go All of these little gaps here, we need to fill them in. Do you do requests for common courses? Heard you were creating a core course. Yes, yes, of course we do requests. We we listen to you guys' uh, feedback and uh, and what stuff you guys are looking for, and we use to you, we use that to to plan out the um, like the curriculum and, and the next things that we're going to be teaching. So this um, actually this weekend I need to finish uh, the the introduction to Maya course. So it's going to be an introduction level course for Maya. And then I'm going to start working on a Marvelous Designer course, which is hopefully will release um, by the end of this month. And after that, it's probably going to be the Action course, a basic overview of, of Action uh, with integration to Unreal Engine. And after that, I still haven't decided. So it might be a ZBrush course, it might be a Blender course. There's a couple of options that we got right there. <coughs> juggling the system shock remake a guilty gear strive and street fighter 6 oh i haven't played fighting games in a while i think the last game i played was street fighter 5 i got my my fight stick over here but i i haven't had a chance to i really wanted to pick strive as well but uh <laughs> you know life gets busy so you can't you can't do a lot of stuff md course would be great yes do you feel the same excitement as chila kid oh sorry about that um cs2 is quite good says ijav do i feel the same excitement with Baldur's gate a little bit yeah but um here's the thing D is so different like um I even in dnd &D, i i try to use the the campaigns like the like the pre pre written campaigns, I mean, I can never do it. I D and D for me is like my playground, so I like to invent and create and change the storylines. And uh, and and that's the one thing about Baldur's Gate that I don't love the fact that it's relative. I, I know there's a lot of options, so I can't really say it's linear, but um, it's a story at the end, right? So I'm I'm getting used to the whole like flow and everything. But I really enjoy the lore, like just seeing all of my favorite monsters and things like that on the game. That's very, very cool. Okay, look at this. Look at the shape of the nose right here. Way different to what they have, right? So let's fix that. Uh, do students prefer to hire... Sorry. Uh, I'm Hai Dang asks, do students prefer to hire 3D special generalists or 3D specialists? I'm a newbie. It's fine. So, it, it, yeah, it depends on the, on the kind of studio. For instance, my studio, since we're a small studio, we just have like five people, um, I prefer generalists because I, I want to make sure that whenever I ask something, it can be done. doesn't matter who who's doing it, right? So generalists, usually that's the, that's the way that you do it. Like for smaller studios are going to look for generalists because they want to cover all their, like all their spots or all their bases. And the big studios like Disney and, and AAA studios and stuff like that, they're usually going to go for, for um, specialists. Not saying that's always the case, but um, at least uh, uh, here in Mexico, for instance, you're, it's going to be a little bit easier to, to find job as a generalist. It's still hard to find job anywhere. But um, but as a generalist, you usually, I usually have a little bit more chances. He looks like Hulk. Yeah, he looks like Hulk. But that's the original art. Like, I think the original Mundo looks a lot like Hulk. Okay, now I, I definitely think like we... Here's where, where we could really use the opacity thing someone was mentioning. So I'm going to zoom in here on the head. I'm going to leave it right here. I'm going to right click on Pubref go mouth and get rid of the always on top and just use the see-through i'm gonna try to match like the nose which is the one that i'm sure we got really close there we go as you can see we're not that far off but there's definitely adjustments that we can make so the nose is 
Like this profile of the nose is right. The eyes are definitely not there. There we go. And then the jaw. Actually, the jaw is also not that bad. Okay, cool. So something like that. And, and the thing is, things are going to get quite distorted. Or might look a little bit distorted. So this is again where, where you as an artist need to start figuring out how to fix and how to to balance whatever we have to, to the new one right here. Like a little bit to the top. So now, okay, of course, this guy is also need to move down and probably a little bit forward. The, the teeth are looking a little bit weird, so let's move them. There we go. Yeah, fighting games can be almost a second job. Yeah, you need to really put in the time to make sure that you uh, you master all of those things. Um, back when I was in Los Angeles, I, I played a lot of uh, Street Fighter V. And I really enjoyed it. I never, like, I was never, like, super good or anything, to be honest. But I had fun. Audium Official, what's up, man? Thanks for the follow. So, Yeah. In Street Fighter, I used to main uh, Kami. Kami was my go-to, my go-to character. Okay, there's something I don't like, and I'm not sure what that is. I'm not really sure what that is. There's some like proportion that's a little bit off. Because again, the side view, we, we pretty much match the the exact sort of uh, exact sort of profile. But even after matching that profile, I feel like uh like it's not there. So here's where I would use my artistic uh, experience, artistic knowledge, or however you want to call it. Just start like modifying certain things to, to make this work as nicely as possible. It's mainly the eyes, I think. So I'm going to remove some of these things with Trim Dynamic again. And if I need to just rebuild. That's another thing that I always tell people. Like don't be scared of just starting over. So if there are certain things that don't flow or they're not looking nice, just start over. Like there's no 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 one's gonna there's no like three D police that's gonna come to your house and be like, oh you're wasting polygons because you're starting over. <laughs> like polygons are free. The only thing that we're losing or investing is time. So as long as the result that we're looking for is good, that's all that matters. Okay, side view looks good. I think it's the hair. Like we need to see a little bit of the of the hair in this sort of like side view. Just gonna give ourselves a little bit of an idea of how this guy is doing. I think the jawline is a little bit small still. So. It looks like handsome. <laughs> like very handsome right now. And I'm not sure. I think it's the eyes. 
Okay, they're not like round enough. Concept jaw is longer. We we did change it. So let's try the front view. Let's see how that one's looking. Because that's the thing. I think there's a little bit of a discrepancy between the the um, the concept art in in the in the views, which is very common. Like I'm not I'm not blaming the artist or anything. It's just that when you're trying to match two images. There's going to be an image that might not perfectly um, like match. Okay, so the eyes seem to be a little bit farther apart. That's the jaw. Yes, it seems like the eye sockets. But no, the, the jaw a little bit longer. Maybe. Yeah, that looks a little bit better, I think. I'm going to keep the image a little bit bigger here. That we can focus a little bit more on the on the proportions. Uh, definitely the the nose thing is a little bit too intense, so I'm gonna flatten it out. The lips are also flatter. I mean, the scars are important, but they're they're not deal breakers right now. I think we're missing a little bit of a dip right there. Corner of the mouth, maybe. Let's add a little bit more um, clay buildup here underneath the eyes. Concepts upper part, lower part width ratio is more dramatic. You mean like uh, it has got like a bigger jaw over here and mine's a little bit too straight? So I can see that. I don't want to like exaggerate it, right? But uh, we can definitely make it bigger. Also, keep in mind, for instance, when we turn perspective on, things are gonna like be distorted a little bit more. Right now, we're on our we're on orthographic view. Let me turn off the hair. That looks more like Thanos. Thanos. This line right here, that's the thing. Like again on the on the concept, on this front view, the nasolabial fold is way smoother. And on the side view is way more intense. So we're gonna have to find a balance right there too. You have it, but not be as intense. Maybe just here a little bit. Let's just smooth. Also, we're missing this line right here. It's a very important wrinkle that we get. It's this one that we see right there. Let's keep building here. a little bit of a fat over here on the the forehead there we go you can see a little bit more volume as you guys say here on the jaw so Let's increase the jaw here a little bit. 
Does that look a little bit better? I think that might be a little bit too much. It definitely looks a little bit nicer. A little bit more stylized cartoon. Now, this uh, dip that we have right there underneath the Segomatic, it's a little bit too much. So, again, Clay Buildup is one of my go-to brushes to just, like, fill in things very, like, naturally. I'm not sure why. <laughs> Sorry. This is not normal because whenever I try to add volume here on the on the eyes, I'm getting an issue with uh with like a very thin eyelid. Let's dynamish real quick. And we shouldn't be getting that. Should like uh roll around the eye a little bit better. There we go. Let's add the gold piece real quick. It's like a sort of like cylinder. There we go. So we're going to grab the cylinder and to make this gold piece that he's got, like this sort of like tag. I'm just going to like make this really small and then mask half of it. We can select half of it. Oh, can we not? There we go. So we're going to mask this and then just extend it. Probably a little bit more. And once that's extended, we just dynamish. Just make it really small. I do miss him having the little like uh like Frankenstein things on the on the neck. But I guess I, I guess I understand why they wouldn't do that. Go. Go back to the character, and I am expecting him to have like a really, really big muscles right here. So, I'm really gonna push this wide a bit. There we go. Of course, it's gonna be the neck muscles going down. Here's where we have the clavicles. Chilaquiles sounds really good. Let me, let me check. There we go. Give me one second, because we might be ordering some chill Achilles for myself and my wife. Yeah, have you guys had chill Achilles? They're really good. They're, uh, I'm not sure if they're like a Mexican dish. Pretty sure they are. It's like a, uh, like corn tortilla, like fried corn tortilla, kind of like nachos. And uh, it's chicken salsa. Sometimes it's uh, green salsa. Sometimes it's red salsa. Uh, beans, cheese, and sour cream. It's a very relatively easy to make breakfast here in Mexico. Very tasty. That that's like the basic version of it. Let me let me just ask uh, Sarai, and and I'll let you know. This is my. Soon to be a brother-in-law, Hector, right there. And he has a breakfast and a food business. 
So if you guys uh, are here in Saltillo and you need some food, ask for La Cocina del Patrón. They're going to be sponsors later. <laughs> There we go. Yeah, so now we're just in the. <laughs> they're gonna. They're. Gonna... He, he wants to go to Ireland because um, he likes uh, whiskey. So some cuts right here. Clean the, the sculpt a little bit. There we go. Let's save real quick and let's take a quick look at how this thing is evolving. Because this is the thing about 3D and uh, it's always like interesting for me to, to show you guys. This is how we started. That was um, our first like level. Like first like 10 minutes. And then we went to this position which was a basic blockout and now we're in this position so you can see how things like evolve right like we've been doing this for what like one hour and 20 minutes something like that an hour and 30 minutes to be precise and you can see the evolution of characters and, and that's actually one of the things that i don't like about youtube i wish i could do like super long videos like three four hour longs where i show you the whole process but they don't get views Unfortunately, they don't get views. People are not going to watch a four hour video. And, and and that's one of the things that's sometimes difficult to explain about the 3D world. Like it requires time. Like there's, of course, a lot of people that are really fast and really efficient and they can create a lot of very cool stuff like very quickly. But it usually involves or, or, or you usually need quite a bit of time to create really cool things. So you're not going to be able to create an amazing art piece in, in just one day, right? Actually, that, that's one of the tips that I always give on my on my portfolio reviews. If it's if you submitted to your portfolio a piece that you did in one day, it's probably not going to be worth it. You need to be really, really good. And the piece needs to be really, really good to um, to be able for you to be able to make it in one day <clears throat> for you to be able to make it in one day and um, and make it to your portfolio. Usually, portfolio should be only reserved for like really, really cool stuff. And cool stuff usually takes time. Okay, so now I think we're in a good position to start adding some of the... Some of the like scars and things like that. So I'm going to break symmetry. And I'm going to use them in the standard. And let's start with this scar right here. And then we have another one, like right around here. Then we have like a crack lip right around here. Now we can go back to to um, symmetrical work if we need to. Like the fact that we're jumping into asymmetry doesn't mean that uh, <clears throat> that we can't continue working symmetrically. For instance, if I need to, I don't know, fix something here on the eyes or or just do some rework or whatever it can definitely be done which need to be careful now that we have this detail not to override it and if we override it we just do it again and yeah every every like giga chat character kind of looks like thanos i'm not gonna deny i'm not gonna what's the quote i'm not gonna deny nor confirm that that is the case and then we have been doing thanos um unknowingly <clears throat> there we go okay let, let's take a little bit of uh, uh time working on the on the hair so i'm going to use a snake hook and here's a, a cool tip about snake hook Ooh. so a snake hook brush is a very cool brush that we have here inside of zbrush 
but you always get that warning that if you use Sculptress, you're going to get a better result. And uh, that's true. So what is Sculptress? Does anyone know what Sculptress? Oh, does anyone know what why this is happening? This is a great question. Marla Piden, <clears throat> do you think it's better when working uh, for a pose? It depends on the on the thing. If I'm going to be using a character for games or for film or for animation or whatever, and you're going to be rigging the character, I like to do it in T-Pose or in V-Pose and then post it at the very end. If I'm doing this for 3D printing, for a portfolio piece or something, I like to do it in, in symmetry and then roughly halfway through, break the symmetry and just start working asymmetrically because it gives you more of a natural look but usually for production it's always going to be symmetrical so this thing right here is a very common mistake that people make when they're using dynamesh and what happens here is you got two like faces of the dynamesh element really close together in this case it's that pinch right there and the dynamesh doesn't know what the real side is so when you dynamesh you get this the best way to do this is try to smooth it out and if it's still if you still get that issue right there then you need to go here to geometry and you can do two things. The one that usually makes it for me is just this, just close holes. If you close holes, that's it. It just like fixes it. And if there was a hole, it's now gone and you're uh, ready to go. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to grab my snake hook brush. And the snake hook brush, I'm going to turn on Sculptress. So what Sculptress does is when I start pulling out a little like strand of hair, you can see there that it creates new triangles and dynamically adds resolution to those little strands. So you get more resolution. Otherwise, if we don't have uh, Sculptress and we just do this, as you can see, we get this very horrible stretching, which we can very easily fix by dynameshing. But Sculptress is just a way to, to do it like uh, at the same time. So here I'm going to just do one, then another one right there, another one right there, another one right there. I'm just using this to, we can give a little bit of uh, silhouette to the whole thing, right? And once we have the, the main like shapes and silhouette, one of the things that we can do is just turn this off. Dynamesh with a slightly higher resolution. And then in this case, I do like using clay buildup to just kind of like start creating or or forming the main like uh, bundles or, or bu bu buckles, buckles, clumps, clumps is the right word. The, the, the small clumps of hair. I'm going to turn off uh, sculptures. We don't need it right now. And the important thing about hair Hair is more about describing the, the form and the shape of hair than it is of actually sculpting the hair. So as long as it looks like hair and you and you manage to portray or, or kind of like imply that it's hair, you're going to be in a good position. Like just doing that right there or it looks like hair for a very basic block it, block out, block in. And, um, and I don't have to worry about sculpting like every single strand of hair. Marlon Pini says, uh, no, uh, Sebas says, if you're studying anatomy, it's better to sculpt without the symmetry. Mm, I would debate that point. I'm not saying it's not right. Like, you will learn a lot, especially because you're going to have to do all the muscles twice for, for the character. Especially if you're doing, like, a really weird pose where one arm is going one way and the other arm is going another way. Um, but I wouldn't say it's necessary. Like, you can... Again, there's there's uh, different ways to, to get to the same sort of, like, result. But it is a very good way to do it. Like um, when I did traditional sculpting, you don't have symmetry in the real world. So so you have to do both sides of the character. And that definitely, definitely helps. Let's go. Let's go. So we got like 15 followers today. That's not bad, guys. Thank you very much. If you've been here since the start of the stream, let me know. Let me know in the chat. By the way, people usually or often ask about uh, if this stream is going to be available later on. And yes, it's going to be available here in Twitch as a BOD, I think it's called. And it's going to be available on YouTube tomorrow as well. Now I'm going to use them in a standard to again separate some of these bundles a little bit.
going to give me a little bit more of a hairy texture. And it's just, it's called, it's just, again, it's just implying the presence of hair. That's just giving me a, a very nice texture. I'm gonna hide the lower jaw for just a second because I want to work on the on the upper lips a little bit. See, one thing that I would love Seabrush to have, I'm not sure if it has it. I don't think it has it. Because if it did, I would already know it. But uh, I would like a bit to have like multiple views. Like if I could have like a side view and, and be sculpting on the perspective view at the same time, that would be great. I was really bummed out when the Seabrush got bought by Maxon, to be honest, because the guys at Pixelogic were doing amazing things, and um, then corporate greed came into place. I don't really sit down and decide I'm going to study anatomy. I'm more just the characters who I know will help me. Yeah, and that's the what that's one of the best ways to do it. Like it's. If you do a project with purpose, like if you have a very like specific purpose of why you want to do a project, like learning anatomy, that's going to get you like closer to your goal a little bit faster. But doing like just basic anatomy exercises, like uh, like drawing the muscles or sculpting the muscles, sculpting the hands, sculpting the eyes, that sort of stuff is always very helpful as well. So if you can do it, that's also going to accelerate your uh, your learning process. A recommendation uh that i heard from daniel bell a digital sculptor from argentina yeah yeah of course no and, and, and as i was saying there's multiple ways to get to the same point so i've had people that say you don't need traditional sculpting i've had people said you absolutely need traditional sculpting so as they say your mileage may vary like we all have different ways of learning as well like some people are are more like visual learners so they are going to be watching a lot of videos some people prefer to read like uh, blogs and tutorials and instructions and things like that there's a bunch of different ways to 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 get to a specific point so it's always good to to see what's out there and uh, and pick whatever works for you like um of course i'm not the only guy that teaches like seabrush and, and blender and, and my and all that stuff but people have told me that they like my teaching style so that's why i do it let's go back here on that scar there we go I'm just going to do a quick pass here on the hair. It's not going to be perfect, but I want to show you guys because there was this question earlier about uh, the renders. So I'm just going to show you a very quick render setup that we can do. What should we do? Blender or Maya? Let me know. Let's do a poll. If David, if you're around there, let's let's do a poll to see. Should we do a quick like a uh, clay render instead of Maya or inside of Blender? You're going to see... You're going to see a little, like, a uh, pop-up on the top of your chat in just a second. There's the, there's the, the poll. Let the people decide. I was, I was remembering, um... One of the cinematics from um, from World of Warcraft. It was I don't think it was the I'm not sure if it was the 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 main cinematic from uh, from Lich King or if it was one of the like in game cinematics when the when the patch to fight the Lich King was approaching. But there was a quote that Arthur says that's freaking amazing. Is like let them come, frost mourn hungers. And he was just like getting ready to destroy all the heroes. Very, very freaking cool. I think Arthas is one of my favorite, um, like a villains or characters from from World of Warcraft.
Blender one by a good margin. That's fine. Let's do Blender. Okay, so here's what we're going to do. Uh, well, let me go to the teeth and I'm just going to like smooth them out a little bit. I'm not going to sculpt them. Uh, I, I feel like that looks like cool. I, I'm not sure. Should we sculpt them a little bit? Yeah, control W groups resolution. Maybe just like a couple of lines here and there too. It's not going to look perfect, but it's going to give us something. Just so that it doesn't look like super weird without teeth. There we go. So, uh, of course, we can't take... I mean, we could, but it, it's going to crash Blender. We can't really take this uh, 3 million polygon... Uh, 3 million points element into... Um, into Blender. It's just going to crash the software, so we need to decimate it. Decimation is the process that we use to reduce the amount of polygons that we have while still keeping all of the detail or as much detail as possible. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to... Um, I mean, we got uh, everything has a different name. Yes, they do. Okay, so what I'm going to do here is I'm going to go to C plugin, Decimation Master. I'm going to do a pre process all. And what this will do is, as the name implies, it will go through each subtool. It will process the subtool and save uh, information from that subtool so that it can prepare the decimation. It might take just like one minute or two minutes. But once we have that, we're going to decimate all of the subtools as separate assets. We're not going to combine anything on the, in this case. And we're going to go into, into Blender. So let me let me move my tablet in one second. One of the things that I don't love about the tablet, I got a, a Huion. It's a it's a pen display. It's very like a voluminous. It's a it's a 16 inch screen, so it occupies quite a bit of space. Okay, there we go. So we're gonna go C plugin and we're gonna now uh, decimate all, I think 20%. I'll actually go, let's go 10%. Decimate all. To control N. There we go. So now, as you can see, we've gone all the way down to 297,000 points. And most of our detail is there. Yes, there's gonna be a little bit of triangulation, but most of the details should be there. Let's go to subtool. Let's get rid of this guy. There we go. Go to like a wide material. And this is like the, the thing that I'm about to show you is the, the, the most basic way to do this. We're going to go to FBX export import. We're going to export in bean, very important in bean, and we're going to export all. We're going to export this as a Mundo. Bring this to the side. What are the recommended settings for this mission? Yeah, 10 to 20% is usually a good, uh, a good amount. You can go lower. It depends on the complexity of the model. So if you have like a very hard surfacey model, you can go really, really low because nothing like everything is or you have a lot of flat surfaces. But for characters, 10 to 20 percent is usually good. As long as you can work in your computer, that's a <laughs> that's one of the signs. Like if your computer is not crashing, you can you can push it up or down. OK, so let's delete that guy right there. Let's say file import FBX. We're going to go to our desktop and we're going to import Mudo. Let's just wait because even though it's decimated, it's still a little bit heavy. So let's make this a little bit bigger. There we go. Let's go to the camera. I personally like to go to N and on the view, I like to use camera to view to frame my character. Uh, let's do let's do a square render. So I'm going to go to the render here. Let's do 2048 by 2048. So a 2K render. I'm going to remove this one, zoom out a little bit, and then turn it back again so we can frame it. And the first thing is, from a camera perspective, we need to define what kind of focal length we want. Usually for characters, you want a relatively flat focal length. Right now we have 50. I usually like 80. I, find, I feel like 80 is a, is a good... Uh, uh, what's the word? A good amount for, for a character. And let's find a nice angle for this guy. I should like... I mean, there's... Let, let's do it so that we can see the little like, gold piece that he has right there. Let's zoom in a little bit more to frame him. And there we go. I'm going to delete the light. I'm going to go to render. We're going to be using cycles. We're going to be using GPU. Let's save before anything bad happens because 
you guys know that with uh with rendering it's very common for the computer to go into like a uh, overdrive or it just uses all of the resources and right now i'm streaming i'm recording and i'm gonna be uh rendering so it's gonna be a lot i'm gonna go to the environment and i'm gonna add an environment an environment texture this is a basic hdri uh we use polyhaven all the time for for this sort of stuff and i'm gonna grab one of the the ones that i use like normally from my main project here so we're gonna be using let's just dancing hall this is the one i really like because it's uh if we go here to to material preview or let's go to render there we go i like this one because it's very clean it's like a like a studio light so as you can see you get a, a very nice detail and Kelhan says, I'm doing a game project with some friends and I'm sculpting a character. Should I merge everything into a single mesh and then read topology of a single mesh or do it subtle per subtle? I'm not sure what's the best word for a game ready character. It depends on the it depends on the on the type of character and on the type of game. Sometimes it's uh, it's good to have everything as a single object, sometimes it's good to have like multiple meshes. If you want, send an image to the Discord channel on the work in progress or send me a private message with the character if you can't uh, disclose things. And uh, I'll I'll be happy to tell you. Usually all of the meshes that are going to deform. So if you have a character like the Hulk, right? I would do a, everything as a single mesh because everything is going to be deforming. But if the Hulk has like a helmet and has like armor pads and stuff like that, those things would be separate meshes so that they can move and, and, and not deform as much as the character. So again, it, it depends. Um, okay, so we got this right here. I'm going to bring the strength. Oh, well, this is a trick. I, I, I've been teaching this on the YouTube channel, but a lot of people keep asking me about this. It's like, can we rotate the uh, the texture here, the, the HDRI, if we want to like move the light around? And the answer is yes, but it's a little bit more tricky than uh, in Maya. So to move the light, you need to go to the hypershade or to the hyper the shading tab. You need to go to world where our uh, element right there is right there. And we're going to be using two nodes. We're going to be using a texture coordinate. There we go. And we're going to be using a... Oh, I always forget about this one. Uh, Which one it was? It's a UB... Oh, man. I always forget about this one. You can press Ctrl T on the marble. It will set it up for you. Is it? Is that the one? On which environment? This one right here? Control T. In preferences. That's a new one. I didn't know. So file. So edit. Preferences. Is it specific, Alan? The node wrangler node wrangler there you go yeah i know the node wrangler there we go and then you grab this one control t there you go thank you very much yeah that's it oh that's a great shortcut thank you there you go so yeah so it's the texture coordinate and then the mapping node and the generated goes to the vector and now the only thing you do is you move the c-axis right here and if we go here to the rendering object and we move the C, we're going to be rotating this thing around. Well, it's not the C, sorry, this one, the C. So that way we can rotate this thing around. So in this case, I want to rotate it so that it's like facing on the right side a little bit more. And uh, and that's what we're going for. I told you the road. <laughs> See, I've been having this issue at least this past year where... I'm not sure if it's because I'm getting older or something. I just like forget and I need to look up my own videos to remind myself how, how to do certain things, like how to connect displacement, how to connect like specific textures and things like that. It, it's just, I, I guess it's because I, I've been using so many softwares throughout the years and um, it becomes a little bit complicated or I or just start just like forgetting certain process, processes. But yeah, the Node Wrangler is, is, the, is like really good. There we go. So point one here on the light to make it a little bit less intense. And I'm going to press Shift A. I'm going to add a light and I'm going to add an area light. I'm going to move this G up to this area and I'm going to point it towards the character. Scale this up so that the light is a lot softer. Right click and we're going to adjust light power. And we're just going to start pushing this right here. So as you can see, this gives us this very sort of like Rembrandt look with a little bit of light on this left corner right here. That's usually a really good way to, to position your light so that you get some nice effect. 
And I, I wish lights had temperature over here, but since they don't, I'm going to be using a sort of like warm tone right here. And then I'm going to go and grab this light again. Shift D. Move it to the back. Point it towards the character right here. A little bit more towards the back like this. This one is going to be uh, blue. And I'm going to right click and adjust the light power and make it a little bit more intense because this is supposed to be our rain light right there. Now, depending on the here, we're going to do a vertical split. Let's uh, go to our camera right here. There we go. So depending on the angle, you might need to move your rain light a little bit. So that we get that nice little effect right there. Another thing I'm going to do is on the environment itself, on the ray visibility, I'm going to turn the camera off so that we don't see any, any effects. So we just get this very basic effect. And finally, the, the good old uh, infinite background. So I'm just going to add a, a background here, a plane. Grab this edge, extrude it up. Grab this edge, bevel it. Add a little bit of, uh, a little bit of um, roundness there. And shade smooth. Rotating C a little bit so that it's facing the same direction as the camera. This one right here, I'm just gonna push it forward a little bit. Probably make it a little bit smaller. There we go. And I am gonna add a new material to that plate and make it darker. So that our mundo here has more of the main light, you know? And that's it! Once you have this, we can go to rendering. We can set like a 30 second limit on the render for now. And just render the image. I remember... Um, the warrior character on Skillshare, Seabrush Beginner Course, where you separate the character and the props while the stylized gunner one was a single... Yeah, that's right. So again, it depends on the on the type of, uh, of the character you, that you're doing and how you're going to handle it, but yeah. You can go to film color management and look for higher contrast. Nice, quite popping detail. Film color management. Where would that be, Odium? Would that be on the um on the post effect or on the preferences? I'm guessing on the preferences here. Color management. Override. Look, high contrast. Is that the one that you mean? Yeah, it's that one, right? I don't see that much of a difference, but let's do another render. Maybe we'll see slightly more punchy details. But yeah, that's it, my friends. Um... That's pretty much it for, for today's demo. And um, again, thank you very much for being here. We're not done with the stream yet. Just want to remind you of uh, some of the events that we have right now going on. So next week, we have our weapon contest, the Weapons of Legend contest. If you start working like right now, you still should be able to uh to get like finished by the end of next week the final submission is a thursday next thursday at 11 59 p.m my time so mexico time and the, again you should have um about that much uh like about a week to to finish the whole thing the next thing that we have going is our portfolio review which is going to be not next week but the week after and you can still submit for our october portfolio review in our official discord channel we're also going through our scotober event which is just a fun event there's no prizes or anything we might do like a hall of fame at the end of the month with the best submissions through the month and every day we have a prompt the prompts are in our discord as well and you can uh, follow that one as well to just keep practicing and keep improving finally right now we have have two premium courses available which uh, Sarn is going to link in just one second and if you want to support the channel if you want to support what we do that's one of the best ways to do it by getting some of our courses and learning from those and uh, yeah that's pretty much it the video this video right here is going to be available tomorrow in youtube so make sure to subscribe there as well we're really close to our next goal which is 3k subscribers in youtube and uh, we're growing we're growing guys we started this project a couple months ago in uh, june at the end of june and uh, 
it's been very very cool so far my goal for the end of the year is to get to 5k subscribers let's see if we can get there in youtube and here i don't know 1k is that too ambitious we'll see but uh yeah that's pretty much it for today my friends thank you very much for being part of this community it's thanks to you that we can do this and um i really got nothing else to add so i'll be seeing you guys in our discord make sure to join thank you very much and i'll see you back on the next stream bye bye